Last time we discussed about tests of general relativity in the quasi-stationary weak field regime of the solar system, where the deviation, let's say h mu nu from the g mu nu all over the solar system were smaller essentially than 10 minus 6 around the sun, 10 minus 8 around the earth, and were slowly varying. So this was quasi-stationary weak field regime. I want to discuss now a uh, test of the dynamics of gravity in the radiative and or strong field regime. And I want to talk about existing tests. And existing tests has been, have been obtained thanks to the discovery in the summer of 1974 by Joe Taylor and Russell Hulse of binary pulsars, okay, which earned them the Nobel Prize. And so this is uh, a situation where you have two neutron stars going around in orbits. The orbits at lowest approximation, they look like elliptic motions, okay. Uh, and um, this is um, Quite, uh, from the conceptual point of view, this is um, a nice example of how to derive gauge, invari gauge invariant, diffeomorphism invariant observables in GR. Because, you know, in the past in GR people were confused about coordinate effects or whatever. But when you think about this and you interact with observers, <laughs> you have to deal with things they observe, really. <laughs> and not, you know, just doing computations. And, and what happens is, there is the far from the binary pulsar, which is somewhere in the galaxy. I mean, at the other end of the galaxy, nearly. Uh, we are uh, on the Earth going around the sun, OK? At, at a relative uh, angle. So I should have drawn this with relative angle, because there are velocities all over the thing. And then you are here observing something. And what you are observing is you have an atomic clock. And you are me measuring times of arrivals which are really uh, proper times, because this is the proper time of a clock on Earth. And what you really observe is this time of arrivals, uh, a sequence of these uh, labeled by an integer, because you really observe the first, the second, the third. And sometimes you have gaps, and then you need a model to know that you have lost like 10,000 pulses, but you have then 10,000 plus one, plus two, and you must keep track that you don't lose one thing. So. So this is evidently something invariant in space-time. And now we want, I want just, I, will, I won't do the derivation, but I want to mention, just mention what goes into the derivation. Uh, this thing, you want to compute tau as a function of n and as a function of various parameters, OK? And to do this computation, you need to think, ah, what, what is n, OK? n means here one of the two objects is a pulsar, which means in its own local frame, if I look in a local frame attached to the pulsar, moving with the pulsar uh, and uh, effacing the external field of the companion, in this frame, and if I view it now in space uh, at a fixed time, uh, the pulsar is a rotating neutron star, which rotates around a certain axis. And then it has a magnetic field structure and, and emission uh, regions, which rotate kind of rigidly in first approximation with this neutron star. And this thing goes around. And then uh, some of this signal will go around, will go maybe near uh, the companion, and then go to Earth. OK. So in order to derive in GR the, the function which gives this proper time of arrival as a function of this integer and of some parameters, you need to do uh, quite a few things. OK. Because uh, first you need to know in some coordinate system, for instance, associated to the binary dynamics, what are the equations of motion of the binary pulsar system. So the first thing you, you need to get the equations of motion. To what accuracy? We are going to discuss that this system has given the first proof of the reality of gravitational radiation. And as I will argue, it's not an indirect proof. It is a very direct proof, probably more direct than what LIGO will give of the existence of gravitational waves. And I will explain 
Why? Because there are less intermediaries. In fact, you can control uh, everything uh, more simply here. Uh, but anyway, this fact means, when you think about it, that you will need to derive the equations of motion. Wait. That the equations of motion, we will need to derive them to the higher accuracy than what I discussed last time. Last time, I, I told you about the derivation to the lowest non-trivial approximation after the Newtonian approximation, something rather simple which was done already by Lorentz and Drost in 1917. Okay? Uh, to get the equation of motion here, we will need to go not only... Uh, so the Lorentz-Drost equation of motion, they were giving Newton, let's say 1 over R square, and then they were giving the V over C square corrections. Okay? Now we will need to go two orders uh, above in the sense that we will need to include the V over C4 and the V over C5 and then just use as an error term V over C6. Okay? Now this is, so this is called the first post-Newtonian approximation. This is the 2PN approximation and this is called 2.5PN approximations. So uh, there was quite a, a lot of controversy after the discovery of the binary pulsars about the derivation of this. And the first complete derivation of the equations of motion at this order was obtained by Natalie Dariel and myself in 1982 uh, of this thing. And so, uh, so what kind of powers uh, for gravitational potential should you count? Okay, so, uh, so 1 over c square is counted either like, uh, you know, the, the Newtonian potential or v square over c square. They are together. And therefore, this thing which means one power of g here or just we so this thing is one power of g over c square or v square over c square square so here it means you need to go you know up to uh, g square you need to include the term g square okay in terms of uh, of just diagrams uh, just to represent uh, things 2pn means actually two loop in the sense that Last time I discussed the, there were two types of diagram, one which was uh, like that and the other one which was like that, which in a topological sense is one loop. Now one needs to go beyond something which includes this or, you know, other things like this, but this one is one of the most complicated because you have nonlinearity here nested inside the second nonlinearity. So you have two nested cubic vertices and things like that. So you need to do that. But you need also to be very careful about including retardation effects. Because last time I said, although in principle, even when I look at the Fokker Lagrangian, I have a time delay in the interaction. When you use the half advanced, half retarded, uh, first you will be conservative because you, uh, you cancel terms in V over C because this is time symmetric. And anyway, this time delay is a short time delay, so you can expand in powers of the delay and get uh, something Hamiltonian, okay? Uh, things here are more uh, tricky. And what is also physically uh, important is that in this system, when you think about a neutron star, okay? Uh, this neutron star is deforming the curvature of space-time around itself quite strongly, not the curvature, but the, the geometry, in the sense that if you compute, let's say, minus G00, which is, so I go back to the Russian signature by putting this minus sign, but I use the minus plus plus, uh, you have essentially near, uh, so it's 1 minus 2U over C square, and near the surface of the neutron star is something like that, where this is the radius of the neutron star. Now, a neutron star have a mass of the order of uh, 1.4, uh, mass, so 1.4 solar mass. Uh, I told you that one solar mass, when multiplied by g over c square, is 1.5 kilometer. So 1.4 solar mass is this multiplied by 1.4, so it's roughly 2 kilometer. This has a factor 2, so here you see that you have 1 minus 4 kilometer divided by the radius of the neutron star, which is 10 kilometer, roughly. Okay? So this means we are talking about a deviation from one which is 40%, okay? So it's not an effect that I can treat 
to just first order or second order, because if I, even if I do it to second order, I make an error bigger than the accuracy of the measurement. So in a sense, we need to take into account self-gravity effects non-perturbatively, or in other words, we need to, in, in terms of diagram, we need to renormalize away and show they can be renormalized away all the self-gravity effects, strong self-field to all orders, okay? This can be done by using asymptotic, uh, match asymptotic expansion techniques, and that was done at the time. So, uh, and when you do the computation, does it change the end result? Uh, we, we are going to see that in tensor scalar theories, it changes it by 100%, in, but not in GR. So when you are in GR, you prove, but it's a, a kind of non-trivial thing, that uh, this can be renormalized away completely. Uh, and uh, hidden in, in, in all those things, you see that now, okay, also the reason why, uh, in fact, you cannot compute just the Fokker action for this case. You compute the equations of motion because here you want to take into account that these propagators are retarded, okay? Because in the computation, what happens is it is the fact that the gravitational interaction between the companion and the pulsar takes a certain time to propagate. In fact, it takes one second because they are one second uh, year light year away. No, one, uh, <laughs> one light second away, <laughs> one light second away. Uh, so it takes one second for the one over R square force if you want to propagate. And this is not negligible at all. It gives terms of this type, but all the nonlinear things have also retardation effects. So you need to take into account all these retarded effects carefully to derive this thing correctly, which is highly nonlinear in G and in one over C square. Okay, this was the, the challenge at the time and it has been met. At the end, you, uh, f first thing, once you have got the equation of motion, you need to solve them, okay? Uh, in some coordinate system. So, which means you need an explicit representation of the position vector in space of the pulsar, let's say, and uh, let's call it A and its companion, uh, as a function of time, but time now in this coordinate system that is not yet related to what we observe, okay? And in doing that, uh, you need to, uh, so the Lagrangian was obtained because, okay, you prove that the equations of motion, they are uh, obtained by adding a certain radiation reaction force, which is, I mean, you get equations of motion that look like a second derivative is equal to uh, x over r cube, the Newtonian force, okay, minus, for the relative motion, minus gm x, which is the, the, the vector of between A and B, let's put it this way, is this, and then you have corrections, these corrections, okay? I'm just putting this with an uh, extra vector, okay? This, uh, you prove that the terms which are like that, they do derive from a Lagrangian, and because of this, they have conserved energy, they are Poincaré invariant, so this part is a conservative part. This extra term, the V phi over C phi, which is here, it is not deriv derivable, it is time disymmetric, okay? It is. If you change the sense of time, it changes sign, while these are even under change of time. And therefore, you can compute its effect on the motion by saying, I have conserved quantities, and the conserved quantity will change in time because of this extra term. So it is in that sense that the fact, so let me insist on this, the fact that gravity propagates at the finite velocity is directly, which means the fact that I have a retarded propagator, a G between the two, gives directly this term. And this term gives directly a change of the period of the orbital system, and that's what you observe. So what you observe is a direct confirmation that gravity, the, interacting gra the interaction of gravity has propagated with the velocity C appearing in the equations, and at the end, the formula depends on this velocity C, and therefore, if you compute at the end C from the data, you find it is equal to the velocity of light, two better than a part in 10 to the 4 now. So in that sense, you have confirmed that gravity propagates with the velocity of light with the two degrees of polarization, which is in the structure of this term. Okay, just to say, contrary to some propaganda of uh, LIGO people, that to my mind, this is a very direct proof of the reality of gravitational radiation and the propagation of gravity. But why is the wave you, you, you don't see the wave. You, see, you just see... You don't see the wave. It's a near zone effect, but it is a time delay in the near zone, which is really propagating in that sense. For the neutral side. Between the two objects. Yes, yes, yes. 
Okay, it's radiation damping at the neutron star, which comes from this time delay. It's not everything you want. I'm not saying uh, the next part of the talk will be about detecting gravitational waves. This is extremely exciting. But this, we know they exist, okay? No, but just because, you know, the LIGO, you observed some uh, fringe change. Yeah. And to relate this to an incoming gravitational waves, you need a lot of theory also on the effect of the detector and all that. So, so I'm so saying... You're not going to test in relativity. You're going to learn about merging. You, you are, that's true. But you are going to do some tests also, I will mention. Although the tests you do are probably less good than the ones that already exist because of binary pulsar. But the most important thing is binary pulsars have established that GR is valid in the strong field radiative. And now we can assume GR to make predictions for LIGO which, and, and find, do astrophysics with it. But you're also, I presume, going to tell us how to use the neutron stars to, to put bounds of gravitational radiation hitting the neutron stars from outside. Uh, no, I, I, there is someone in the room who was telling, asking me questions about it. I'm not going to discuss this. Let me continue what I'm going to say. So for instance, when you solve uh, the equation, remember, even at uh, the einstein infel hoffman lorentz drost equations of motion, they are not trivial. You remember the v-square versus c-square term? They have a complicated algebraic structure. Not so complicated, okay? But still a little bit complicated. And when you try to ex write explicitly the solution, what existed in literature before, even if you open textbooks, is that uh, you found only complicated formula for the solution explicitly as a function of time, expansion sometimes of elliptic functions, uh, algebraically complicated. In fact, part of the job, which is trivial at the time, was to find that the solution of the equations of motion can be written in quasi-Keplerian form. That is to say, you can write a Keplerian solution just with sine, cosine, and the usual formula, and you make small changes here and there, delicate changes, and then the same formula works. Okay? And then from this solution, now you need to do the timing because as I said, what you observe is this proper time here. And therefore, you need now to solve another problem, which is this thing is sending electromagnetic waves that you can model as a null geodesic. And this null geodesic, but for each turn. So you need also to keep track of what is the <coughs> angle of rotation in its proper frame of this object. And then this thing is moving, is in a gravitational field, is emitting this, which goes around. So you need to solve the geodesic, null geodesic equation here. And relate this proper time here, d tau here, to like the proper time dt along this thing, okay? By taking into account various things. So you can do that. And what is nice also is that you can do it in such a transparent way that you can parameterize the formula, which is now called the, uh, the, the DD timing formula for Nathalie Deruel and myself, that uh, express this explicitly this thing in terms of certain parameter. And I will just write uh, a little bit of this formula, which is, for instance, you introduce uh, um, an eccentric anomaly, which is an old name which dates back from Kepler, okay? You know that uh, for the Newtonian motion, Kepler's law is that you can introduce an angle uh, which is not the angle along the trajectory and an eccentricity such that u minus e sine of this u is just equal proportional to time. So it's 2 pi uh, time divided by the orbital period, OK? This would be Kepler's law, OK? And in GR, although there are many complications, you can write the same formula, uh, except that now this effect, the main, the main effect of this term here is to introduce an extra term here, which is p dot b, which is quadratic. In, in time, okay? Which is saying that uh, the time it takes for the pulsar to come back on its periastron is not constant, but uh, is slightly decreasing. And this is just because in the usual way it is, let's say, losing energy, and therefore it goes faster and things like that. But you don't need to say that it loses energy and I use energy balance. You just solve the equations of motion, and then you get this term with an explicit formula for PB dot, okay? Which comes directly in the observable thing. So this is one formula which looks like Kepler. And then the main term in the, the, main term in the timing formula is to say that the pulsar is going around in orbit. And I'm observing 
uh, time signals here. So evidently, if the pulsar is further away on its orbit or closer in, I should see an effect which is crossing the orbit, light time crossing of the orbit. And this term, you can write it in a very simple form, which is also quasi-Keplerian, which is this, x sine omega cosine u. I will write the Kepler formula, okay, which would be this one, plus x square root of 1 minus e square uh, cosine omega sine u. So if I were in uh, Newtonian mechanics, that would be the exact uh, solution of the Kepler motion projected along the line of sight. GR makes some changes, like for instance, this is the position of the periastron, and in GR, omega is a function of u, which is a constant, plus a certain uh, periastron advanced parameter times two arctangent of square root of 1 plus e over 1 minus e tangent of u over 2. So this term is periastron advance, okay, that you expect to be here. But by the way, periastron advance is not linear in time, okay? It has this arctangent thing, and you can check that to some degree that this is important prediction of GR. Now here I add an eccentricity. Uh, when you are in full GR, there is a correction in the sense that this eccentricity is the eccentricity which appears in the time equation. And here you have an eccentricity which is like a geometric shape eccentricity, which is different. So this one has a 1 plus delta r. And this eccentricity has also a, a different variation, 1 plus delta theta squared. So you see, there are small modifications of Keplerian formulas, but the formulas are quite manageable, OK? That will be the second part of my talk. Good. Uh, now, uh, the parameters that come in this formula, so there is this k parameter, which is uh, the, sec the periastron advance. So this is like periastron advance multiplied by period divided by 2 pi, let's say, average omega dot. Then I, we have seen, yeah, there is a parameter that I did not write, which is called gamma timing, which is nothing to do with the gamma of Eddington. This gamma timing means that the pulsar is a clock, okay? This clock is moving around, and therefore I have a second order Doppler effect. You know, a clock does not run in the same way if it moves with velocity. There is a V square over C square effect. But the clock is also moving in the gravitational field of the companion, which sometimes is near, sometimes is far. These two effects add together to make a second order V over C square change of the clock rate compared to what I measure on Earth. And all this is lumped in a parameter gamma, okay, called gamma, gamma timing, which is a function of the masses and things like that. Then uh, there is PB dot, which appears here. And then there are other parameters, which are called the range and the shape of the Shapiro time delay. And there is this delta theta. And okay, there is a, a, a bunch of parameters like that. Now, let me discuss how uh, in each theory of gravity, so. So the main point, and this is a point we made with Joe Taylor in a paper in, uh, I forgot, 90, no, eight, or anyway, 90, I think, in which we said, okay, this formula, uh, either uh, in GR, you see, uh, all the parameters in this formula, like for instance, this term comes from the, the V over C squared, the radiation damping term in the equations of motion. So it is not independent of the other parameter. It is a function of the masses and the other parameter, okay? But actually, the shape of this formula, the mathematical structure, you can show it will be the same <coughs> if I look at any tensor scalar theories of gravity in which I, I might modify even strongly the value of this as a function of the other parameters, but this form would remain the same. And therefore, you can use this form to fit data. So you have a, the, the observational data is a list of time of arrival. So uh, I, I get signals at irregular times, you know, because uh, the pulsar is moving and many effects. This is the set of data. I can fit, best fit this sequence of observed time to a formula of this type. And then I extract from the fit what are the parameters of the system. And on one side, I have the Keplerian parameters, which is like the eccentricity and orbital period. That is to say, Keplerian parameters are the ones that would exist in a Keplerian description. And then I have other parameters that exist only in a relativistic description, and they are just called 
post-Keplerian parameters, and you fit that. Now, in any theory of gravity, the post-Keplerian parameters are functions of the Keplerian one and the masses. For instance, this parameter, which is periastron advance, it is in GR given by the formula 3 divided by 1 minus e squared, g times the sum of the two masses over c squared, sorry, cube, to the two thirds. But because of the two thirds, this is a 1 over c squared effect. Uh, gamma timing GR is also a function of M1 and M2. Uh, the P dot, which is this change uh, of the orbital period, and that was uh, the main point of the calculation, was to obtain this radiation damping effect. So at the end of the day, you get that this is 192 over 5 pi times 1 plus 37 over, uh, what is it, 24 e squared plus 73 over, no, sorry, this is 73, and this is 37. These numbers are important. Uh, divided by 96 e4 divided by 1 minus e squared to the 7 half times uh, m1 m2 divided let me denote the sum of the two masses let me introduce this notation m1 plus m2 the sum of the two masses I call capital M okay so the product of the masses divided by the square of the sum of the masses which appears here times this thing, G, ah, sorry, I forgot to put here uh, n, but I will explain, gmn over c cube, to the uh, three-fifth, five-third, okay? n denotes the orbital period, which means two pi over pb. It's the orbital, uh, sorry, it's the orbital frequency, okay? The mean orbital frequency. And this thing is a dimensionless uh, number. So you see, this thing has a 1 over c cube to the power 5 cube. So this means that this, this is an effect of order v over c5. It contains 1 over c5, while here it contains 1 over c square. Okay? So this was the most difficult term to obtain. And for the other parameters, you can do the same thing. R, S, function of m1 and m2. And now the basic point we did with Joe was when you observe a binary pulsar, you can extract from the data the observed value of this parameter, this parameter, this parameter, and in principle, more parameters. Now, if you observed only two of these parameters, as these two parameters, let's say, you get, you observe this and this, periastron precession and second order Doppler effect. These are functions of two masses, but I don't know a priori what is the mass of the pulsar and the mass of this companion, okay? So it gives me two equations for two unknowns. So I can compute the unknown masses M1, M2 from these two equations. But the third observable now, which is again a function of the two masses, now I can plug in, uh, in here what I can deduce from this, and therefore I get a test of the theory of gravity. And therefore the conclusion is that you, the number of tests of any theory of gravity you, you, you will obtain is simply the number of post Keplerian parameters minus two to eliminate the two masses. Uh, was, uh, yes? Very short question. Yeah. Yes? If I just use quadruple formula, is that consider dynamic? Then you get this. Observable. Then you get this, yes. Okay. At the end. Is that what I mean concerning observations? I mean, uh, uh, comparing this experiment? Yeah, you, then you don't get this, you don't get this, you don't get this. I mean, you need more than, I mean, quadruple formula is, uh, would give you this, okay? Uh, the Periastron formula for binary system would give this. So what existed in textbooks, uh, in, in a sense, was this and this, okay? Not the rest, okay? Now, uh, let me just give some, uh, let me actually show you the figure, and then I will give you the, the, the data, because I have a figure, yes. So uh, now there exist uh, several, so this was the original, I, I was discussing here, the original Ulsteller pulsar. Now there are more than one binary pulsar. And um, so how do we project this uh, on my screen? It is project. Ah, sorry, we need to move the screen down. Y maybe did not expect me, because what's his name? In the meantime, I will write what I will need next.
Yes. Yes. And now on this thing? Ah, yes. So slowly appears the 11, now today we have 11 tests of radiative gravity and strong field gravity in four different binary pulsars. In total, 11 tests. That is to say, uh, it, it was the counting I was saying. There, there are pulsars where you measure always more than two, and then you have. The original binary pulsar is this one, 1913 plus 16. For this system, although originally we developed the general theory for this, finally the extra parameters are barely measurable, and in fact they are disappearing now. I won't get into the story that this system will disappear uh, soon. We won't be see it, it for hundreds of years. I will say why. Uh, now, uh, the, the, the good test you obtain is obtained by having three curves. So I said in, in mathematical terms, periastron precession and these gamma timing parameters are <coughs> function of the two masses. Therefore, they define level lines, modulo and error bar. But the error bar is so small that you would not see it on this line. It's, it's not quite like CMB, but still the error bars here are very small. And therefore, I have two curves that intersect at this point. And now you do a third measurement, which is this reality of gravitational radiation. The third measurement is P dot, which is the time delay due to propagation of gravity. And then it gives a third curve that very nicely intersects here. I will give the numbers, OK? Can you repeat the meaning of omega and gamma, please? Uh, omega dot is just periastron precession. Okay. Gamma is this combined second order Doppler effect and the fact Einstein effect, the fact that the pulsar is in the gravitational field of its companion and gravitational change of the redshift. Red redshift yeah. Together, second order Doppler plus redshift. These are the two things. And this is the, the radiation damping. Okay. So here you see you have one nice confirmation, but this is like a combined confirmation that everything is okay, uh, that is a strong field effects, radiative effects altogether. What was important uh, when we mentioned this at the time with Joe is that in this system, the second uh, binary pulsar discovered, binary neutron star pulsar discovered, you see you have uh, obtained many more, I mean not many more, uh, but there is omega dot and gamma that intersect at this point and then, in addition, you measure R and S, which are parameters which are not of radiative nature. And therefore, the fact that this is a strip. Yeah, before, the, the error bar was so small that you could not see the width of the thing. Why for R, you see, there is a, it's a width. Okay? For S, also, it is a strip. But this strip, they pass exactly through the intersection of gamma and omega, which is this point here. And therefore, here you have two strong field confirmation of GR, which does not depend at all on radiative effects. So it's nice. You know strong field gravity is OK. But the picture is not OK. Ah, it's my computer. Sorry. Yes. Yes, so it will take time to. On the screen, you can see. So it's my fault. It takes time. It, I see it on my screen, so it will show. Yes. And in addition, you have also the P dot. So you have also the radiative effect. Although you see the error bar here is here, and then there is, it's a slight discrepancy, but anyway, this is one sigma, okay, so uh, this is less than two sigma away, so. And uh, there is also this pulsar, which gives uh, extra tests, and the most interesting pulsar was the recently discovered double binary pulsar, in which you observe both the, uh, the what you call originally a pulsar, and the companion is also a pulsar. And here now, you see, you are crowded by measurements, and all those measurements, they interact in one point here, OK? So, and so this gives a uh, beautiful test. And now, OK, in thank you. In origin uh, pulsar, there was one pulsar and the other, what was it? It's a neutron star, but you don't observe it. So you don't know what it is. Indirectly, you know it must be a neutron star, but you don't know what it is. OK, we, uh, so if I just close it, it will disappear now. Can you uh, lift this up? Thank you. Uh, I will show other things later. I come back to the blackboard. You, you probably said this, but I don't understand. Do you have to assume something about the angular momentum of the two bodies? 
No, I mean, uh, of individual spin, you mean, or yeah. orbital angular momentum? Orbit. No, you, you use the equations of motion to show to what extent it is conserved and not conserved. It is not conserved, actually, and it's the non-conservation of angular momentum which gives this effect, because it's linked to radiation damping. Let me give just some numbers quickly. So, uh, the p, p dot uh, for the original binary pulsar, the p dot you observed, when you do things in GR, uh, the observed divided by the GR predicted as a function of two other observables, k and gamma observables. So, you see, I have one, two, three observables together in this formula. And actually, I still remember when I got, uh, that was the early days of email, an email of Joe telling me, Thibault, we have a problem because the ratio of the observed to GR predicted start differing from one, okay? At <laughs> three sigma or more, four sigma. And then we thought about it and we came up with an explanation, <laughs> but which exists, which is that the binary pulsar is moving in the galaxy and in the galaxy it is falling in the galaxy because there is a gravitational field. And therefore it means there is a relative time varying Doppler effect between the pulsar and you need to <coughs> subtract it and when you subtract it, the number came right on where it should be. And, uh, but this correction is not negligible now compared to the data. And at the end, when you do that, you have this 997 plus or minus 0 0.002. So it is a 2 times minus 3 test of GR, I mean confirmation of GR. In the double binary pulsar, which was the last one here, you get a p dot over pb, where first you don't need this correction, it is negligible, I will write it here, and you get something which is 1 to a part in 10 minus 3, so plus or minus 0 0.001. So you are uh, at the 1 10 minus 3 level, and let me just quote another test that in the double pulsar, if you take this parameter s, uh, which means the shape of the Shapiro time delay, let me not define everything, you divide the observed thing by the GR predicted as a function of two other observable in the system, because I always need to use two equations to determine the masses and plug the result in the, any other observable, and then I do the ratio to what is observed, and this is equal to 1 to an even better accuracy, now we are 4, 0, but uh, the last thing is a 5, uh, under 3, 4, under 3, 4, uh, 5 times minus uh, 4 uh, things. Okay. In addition to this direct S, uh, because you mentioned, uh, but no, it's not the same thing. I, uh, I mentioned it. There are spin orbit uh, coupling effects in the sense that the, the pulsar uh, is, a, is a gyroscope. The pulsar is a spinning object. And this pulsar is moving in a gravitational field. And like any, like an uh, electron moving in an atom, there is a spin orbit coupling. And therefore, you expect precession of the spin. In fact, I remember because my first published paper when I was, it was December 74, I was 23, was to predict that you should see this effect and as a consequence of the, with Remo Ruffini, and, uh, and therefore, because the pulsar would be moving around, maybe the pulsar would become invisible from Earth because you see the pulsar because it is shining in your eye. But if it moves somewhere else, it will shine somewhere else in the galaxy. And this is going to happen because uh, it has been, this effect has been observed for the original binary pulsar. It is moving in space and in 20 years it will disappear. And it will be invisible for 200 years and then it will come back. And now there are several binary pulsars that you see doing that. There are pulsars that uh, were not seen and then they appeared and there are pulsars that we have seen appear and disappear. So we see this spin orbit relativistic effect quite well. The last point I want for binary pulsar I want to discuss before going to gravitational waves is about here I was discussing the comparison between uh, observation and theory in the GR framework. Now in order to see what you actually test it's useful to do the same calculation in a different theory of gravity just to see if really there are strong field effects that could have been seen. For instance the mass renormalization maybe is not true in other theory of gravity and things. And we did a complete theory of that with Gilles esposito Fares in uh, the simple framework of tensor scalar theories that I explained yesterday. Remember where uh, we were saying uh, the, the metric to which matter is coupled differs from the Einstein metric 
uh, which appears in the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian by a coupling function which is written as the exponential of a certain function a of phi, okay? Now, this function a of phi is, defines for you the theory. So it's like in inflation, it's like a v of phi, but it is a coupling function. And what we said um, yesterday was when you do weak field tests of GR in our alternative theories in the solar system, you are exploring a very small neighborhood of 1.50 in field space, which is the VEV, the vacuum expectation value of phi around the system, and you have small, small fluctuation of 10 minus 6, 10 minus 8 around this point, okay? When you do the, the same theory for binary neutron stars, you find that you explore much more the shape of this function, okay? And therefore, you are going to see effects that you would not see in the weak field. And one way to test that is to parameterize this function just uh, like in inflation where you do that. So weak field things just test the first and second derivative because remember when I was discussing tests I said historically there were two parameters called gamma and beta uh, or when I subtract one gamma bar and beta bar Eddington okay or PPN and these were given in terms of the slope of this thing alpha by minus two alpha square over one plus alpha square and the other one was proportional, was containing the, the de second derivative, so alpha prime, if you want. Uh, Pache, not Pache, but thanks to Gabriele, no, um, it's a joke. Uh, given by one half of alpha, alpha prime, alpha over one plus alpha square, square, okay? Uh, and uh, we can give names, so uh, to, in order to have a theory which contains these two parameters but can also go beyond them, you, it's enough to take a function which is quadratic. So you take a function which is uh, alpha zero phi plus one half of beta zero phi square, and then in this theory, alpha will be alpha zero, alpha prime will be beta zero, and these will be functions of this. So this is just a simple parameterization of a class of theories which can parameterize all the PPN thing and parameterize also non-perturbative effects in, in strong. When you do that, at the end, you find constraints in the plane of the theory parameters beta zero and alpha zero. And the only uh, point I want to make is, as we have discussed yesterday, the current limits from the best solar system uh, test is that alpha zero square must be smaller than 10 minus five, okay? Which means that this alpha zero here is smaller than 10 to the minus uh, three, 10 minus three. So they exist, let's say, logarithmically uh, there exists a limit. So the solar system is saying that this is excluded, okay? But the value of beta zero is nearly not constrained because the parameter you observe in the solar system is the product of, so this thing is beta zero alpha zero square, okay? So as alpha zero square is already very small and the limit on beta are not as good as 10 minus five, beta zero could be of order unity. So you don't really uh, see any limit actually. Why? When you do the, uh, so, and then we found with Gilles that there are non-perturbative effects in uh, that we call spontaneous scalarization. That is to say, there exist theories in this plane, so a point in this plane is a theory, okay? A point here is the value of alpha zero and beta zero, each point, and therefore it makes predictions. And you want to do a comparison for each point in this plane to the observed binary pulsar data. And then you have excluding, uh, excluded regions from doing that. And when you do this, you find that well, the binary pulsar exclude a region of the type something like that, okay? So in particular, they exclude all this region which was allowed by uh, solar system tests. So you see, you have a, a vast uh, region where one parameter was small, but the other one could be anything you like, uh, uh, which is excluded by this. And the reason, and it also excludes this thing on both sides, okay? So this is just, okay, it's a proof of principle which shows that you are testing more than the weak field because in this thing, there are really uh, in tensor scalar things, you can have something that in the solar system is equivalent to GR to any digit you want, 10 minus 20, 10 minus 100. And in the binary pulsar, it could give 100% deviation. We gave examples of this, okay? But, but they are excluded already. So uh, we know GR from this point of view is confirmed deeply. Yes? No, but it's this sense you are excluded from C 
Spirit, which are more extended than GR. Yes. But it doesn't still mean that strong field in GR, or maybe say You have I tested know. some aspects of strong field in GR, OK? Some aspects, right. You see I mean, we are not claiming, uh, we are never claiming you have excluded everything, <laughs> tested everything. No, you no, know, no, no, science no. is I mean a. a strong field, I mean strong deviation from Minkowski, not for the expense of, uh, for instance, the next. Uh, no, I mean also strong deviation from Minkowski. Uh, we have shown that it seems that the, uh, the way GR predicts uh, strong deviation from Minkowski is well compatible with all data. And if you try to do something different, you might find something completely but wrong, where, OK? Where do we see binary binary pulse, for instance, in GR strong field? It's a, it's a gene or not to be different from Minkowski. That's what I said at the beginning. This was the point four, OK? Yes, but it's a 60% deviation, 40% deviation surface. on the surface. On the surface. But, but this comes the in the dynamics. It affects, you know, the, the self-gravity. The, OK, another argument is part of 15% of the mass of the pulsar is self-gravity mass. OK? Ah, you mean the and, the and the data are at the time minus 3 level. Yeah. OK, so 15%, I mean, uh, yeah. so we are testing you some. Mean you mean the strong field? And, and strong uh, self gravity, yeah, okay? Strong self gravity influence the uh, so emission of the gravity wave. Uh, at the end, with all the observables taken into okay, account. Only Not only. only. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I should yeah. say, it's, for this case, it's even a, a very strong effect because, as Doug Erdley first uh, mentioned, and which is included there, in alternative theories of gravity, in general, you n emit not only quadrupole, but also dipole radiation. And quadrupole radiation formally is V over C5 corrections. Dipole radiation, as we know from electromagnetism, is V over C cube. And in general, it means it's parametrically much larger. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are other tests at very high accuracy that show there cannot be dipole radiation. So it's a strong uh, indication. So we cannot exclude all theories, but still we have, anyway, uh, I think Popper was wrong. We are never excluding theories, but we are confirming theories. Okay, We are confirming GR. <laughs> and showing that around GR, other theories are excluded. That's good enough for the time being. Uh, yes, Slava, let me now continue. <laughs> we can, <laughs> we, we are good friends, wow, we will discuss now. <laughs> I, want to, I want to go, because I, I, I have up to, oh, Eliezer is away, no, you are the chairman. You, okay. I have uh, up to what, 5.30? Yeah, I yeah. forgot, yes. 5.30, <laughs> yes. Gravitational waves, okay? Although I will not cover everything, but this is a kind of uh, uh, link to, to this thing. Uh, uh, because this is an extension uh, of the thing. Some of the most, uh, uh, so we have not yet observed now gravitational waves in the solar system. We, LIGO and in Europe, Virgo are uh, existing detectors of gravitational waves of the interferometric type. Okay, three, four kilometers long arms that are waiting for gravitational waves to come on the Earth from the outside universe and make some fluctuation in the length of the arms to be detected in some in optical interferometric fringe. And the, some of the most important sources that we expect to detect in the, two, in the four years to come are uh, either binary neutron star, and this is, in the sense, the most secure source. Because we know that binary pulsars exist. We know binary neutron stars exist. We know that they get closer and closer because of these radiative effects. And we can compute how many of them will merge in so many years. And then we do an extension of these to many galaxies. And then we can compute if you can see this amount of signal, you will know how many you are. And then the conclusion of this is you should see realistically 30 events per year. Maybe less, maybe three, maybe 300, something like that. <laughs> it's what it's I just said. Of 10, of 10. That's what I just said, Barak. Okay, yeah, okay. I said 30, between three and 300. Okay, okay. we agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, and then there are binary black holes. We don't know if binary black holes of 10 solar mass really exist in the universe. And probably uh, they exist. And we don't know how many of them really exist, but numbers models, let's say astrophysical models, suggest they, they would exist in roughly the same numbers as the binary neutron stars, and they would be more prominent because now we have two, we have 10 solar masses going round instead of 1.4 solar masses, so the signal is just stronger by a factor of 10 divided by 1.4, and therefore uh, maybe we will see them. But 
we will see them. So what happens when I have a binary system? So these are called compact binaries, okay? Neutron stars or binary. They go around. They go around initially, as we see from the binary pulsar, in elliptical orbits. First, it's easy to see that if you solve the equation of motion for a long time, the eccentricity diminishes. We, we see them going closer. So the system will be smaller and then will become circularized. Okay? Something like that. Is it correct? Uh, <laughs> yes, let's hope. Uh, two circular orbits, uh, and, uh, which simplifies life. And uh, so what are the gravitational waves emitted by this system? For a long time, this is just like a sine wave. But then they get closer and closer because we have observed that P dot, the change of the orbital period is negative. Okay, I did not give the number, but it gets shorter. Okay? And therefore, the orbital frequency gets higher. And therefore, this thing, because it, go, it goes higher, but the velocity goes higher also. So the signal is amplified because the thing goes faster. And the signal, you see, increases in amplitude and in frequency. So it's something like that. And this lasts for hundreds of millions of years. And in the, in the last uh, few minutes, uh, they, will, uh, they will go to a fraction of the velocity of light, and then like one, one half of the velocity of light, and merge. Okay? And at the end, when they merge, if these are two black holes, they will create a third black hole, which will emit a ringing mode, which is damped very quickly. So at the end, you expect the thing to, to decay quite fast. Just by drawing this, you understand that the, the most important signal, I mean, it's not really true, but the last orbits contain the strongest signal, okay? And if your detector is sensitive to frequencies that correspond to the last <coughs> orbit, then you will be more sensitive to last, last orbit. But uh, this is the case, because LIGO is most sensitive to 100 hertz frequency, and when you put some numbers, 100 hertz for 10 solar masses black holes going around corresponds to the last few orbits. Therefore, you need, theoretically, to be able to predict the motion and radiation of binary systems up to the last orbit. Now, this is a challenge, because before I was speaking of like first post-Newtonian, second post-Newtonian. So what are the techniques to do that? Actually, the techniques to do that uh, are obtained by a synergy, that is to say, putting together in a positive way and self-complementary way several approximation techniques. And what are these several approximation techniques? First, there is still the old post-Newtonian theory, but pushed to new heights uh, in the sense that, actually, uh, I remember in 1982 when uh, I had just finished the, the 2 pn calculation, I thought, okay, that's done. We will never need for physics to go beyond that, okay? Actually, we need, because if you use only the 2PN, you realize that you will stop earlier than this, and you need to try to use perturbation theory to go beyond. Although perturbation theory is not very efficient to go beyond uh, a few orders, because you don't know if you control things. Uh, one, uh, okay, in, uh, so when was it? In 2000, uh, we derived the 3PN approximation for the first time, and this year, or I should say last year, because we have changed of the year, in 2014, so I should uh, mention my, my co-author. So with uh, Yaranovsky and Schaefer, uh, in 2000 we derived the 3PN, and in 2014 we derived the 4PN. And I will mention this because there are conceptually interesting things at four. So it is a four-loop calculation, okay, in, in the classical GR sense. And I should say that this calculation was not done by using the traditional PN method or the type of Fokker action that I mentioned, which are usually done in a uh, Lorentz type gauge, harmonic gauge, but they were done by using the Hamiltonian Arnovit Desert Misner formalism, which is linked to what Slava told us uh, about, as now you are uh, awaking from your iPhone, uh, <laughs> which is a decomposition. <laughs> a decomposition where the, the gravitational degrees of freedom are contained in the HIJ TT part of the metric, and you use a gauge where the, like the longitudinal parts, the 0, 0 and the 0, I, are in a Coulomb-type gauge. So the 0, 0 and the 0, I do not propagate with the D'Alembert thing. They are instantaneous, and all the propagation is in the TT part. It, it seems that this gauge is very efficient. Nobody has... Uh, been able to reproduce our calculation, but we have independent evidence that this is uh, uh, correct. 
So this is one method. The second method is a gravitational self-force, which is the following idea. People have uh, understood. So here, when I say 4 pn in a classical sense, it means you need to compute things uh, like that, OK? So I need, uh, so here I have 1, 2, 3, and then, for instance, 4, OK? Four loops, things like that. So you use the nonlinearity of Einstein equation a lot. Uh, but you need not only this, by the way, because we will need to solve two problems. You need to solve what is the dynamics, but you need also to solve what is the emission of gravitational radiation for two reasons, because this is what you observe, you observe the wave, and also because it's the emission which now is used to compute radiation reaction. At this level, you cannot compute radiation reaction as part of the equations of motion. It would be too difficult to compute. So you assume the balance between loss of energy and angular momentum at infinity drain out of the system, okay? And you just compute gravitational waves. But it's so this means you need to compute things like that, you see? But it's larger than how much? What is the, co what is the bad reaction? 10%? Less? Uh, it's, it's, it's what drives the system. Uh, what, what makes the system change its frequency in time is radiation reaction. So the, you need to compute this to the highest possible accuracy, okay? And this is done now to 3 pn also. Ah, you mean Fractional, the yes. Was collapsed because of the emission yes, of yeah. Let me, we, we, Slava not got the point. I, I hope everybody else had got the point that this system, yeah, okay, uh, is getting nearer and nearer because of the emission of radiation. And in the last orbit, they are so near that they, they, they merge, okay? So gravitational self-force means that people have understood that if I take a two-body system and one of the two bodies has a large mass, let's call it M2, and the other one a small mass, let's call it M1. So this means this is a situation where uh, I have a small mass moving around a large mass. So in zeroth approximation, I know how to solve this because this is a test particle moving around a Schwarzschild black hole, okay? So this thing, I know the zeroth order dynamics. But I can go beyond the zeroth order dynamics and do one loop in curved space-time. But one loop in curved space-time, which means this, means in perturbative language that I can compute things with a very large number of loops in a perturbative sense, OK? And, and this calculation called gravitational self-force, there is a lot of activity around this both theoretical and numerical, and uh, analytical also in the sense that recently, especially with Donato Bini, we have shown how to use, uh, and using works by the Japanese group, how to compute quantities of direct relevance to the dynamics of binary pulsar to a very high loop order. In fact, our latest published results are at eight loops, and in the last two days, my collaborator sent me that now we have pushed the calculation to 10 loops just for fun. And uh, I don't want to discuss that, but there is an interesting like a number theory aspects to it. Is yeah. As you know, in these high loop calculations, there are transcendental numbers that come in. Like for instance, we were surprised at in the Lorenz Dross Lagrangian, there are only rational numbers, okay? When you go to 2pn, uh, there were only rational numbers. And as a naive physicist, I, at the time, I'd assume I will get rational numbers all the time. We were surprised that at 3 p.m. there is zeta 2 pi square coming in. And then we start seeing more complicated zeta 3, higher things, log uh, gamma, earlier gamma, and things like that. So you see, okay, all this. Thing. But there, there is, by the way, an entire industry in mathematics linked to the work of Grothendieck, I should mention. Uh, the uh, as they said, the most famous mathematician in the world who died uh, last week and who was the first permanent professor at my institute, Alexandre Grotendik, uh, born Shapiro. I mean, his father was Shapiro. Anyway, uh, <laughs> now, and, and, and last but not least, numerical relativity. In that sense, yes. Some kind of icon or no, in. Uh, Um, no, but the number of loops is, okay, I think. I think, except if you could, uh, you, there does not exist a gauge where the calculation can be a linear calculation. Uh, I mean, you, when, when you do this calculation here, you solve uh, hypergeometric equations, for instance, analytically, and you examine. These are non-trivial things, okay? It's not, okay. 
but it's not a loop in the q q full yeah, QFT it's still sense. A truncation of the whole this is a truncation because here you take into account terms you know which contain m1 square and many powers of m2. Okay, so it's m2 to the power uh, something and m1 square. You don't have all those terms like that. Okay, it's it's just part of the problem, but it's. Yes, uh, what you compute are gauge, uh, we only compute gauge invariant quantities. Which now let me say, last but not least, switch, numerical know. relative, maybe it can be postponed at the end. I think no, the so chairman we'll thinks it's probably. Because you see, <laughs> you, are doing, you are doing perturbation theory when the hex are of the order of y during last thing. So what is the parameter of expansion? You're going to there see, I will say. Yes? Okay. Uh, I will say. Yes, uh, that's indeed a good question. Now, the, the uh, very important uh, progress, which as, uh, after 30 years of development, finally the breakthrough came from uh, Franz Pretorius, who uh, saw, showed to everybody how to compute the, the, the motion of two black holes uh, up to the end, up to merger. And after that, many groups in the, uh, on the Earth have succeeded in doing that. Numerical relativity, which means 3D, solution, 3D simulations of the full Einstein equations for two black holes. Now, there are several groups in the world that can do that, and in particular the Caltech Cornell CETA collaboration. And they can compute uh, waveforms, and I will show examples of waveforms and their comparison to analytical methods in a second, if you leave me some time. And uh, these have provided important uh, information because they provide really the description of the last orbits and the merger. So they are allowed to test and improve, and sometimes correct, but actually improve, the analytical descriptions of the motion. So, uh, and I will describe that uh, now. But uh, before coming to this, let me mention quickly uh, about uh, the, the emission of gravitational waves, because there are two parts in this calculation, the motion and radiation okay, of uh, binary black hole system. To, to compute this, we need a relativistic formalism to compute, to go beyond the quadrupole formula. Okay, if you open the Bible of physics, landau Lifshitz, you go to volume two, field theory, you have a, a small chapter which contains um, a lot of the essential information on GR, and in it you have the quadrupole formula, okay? And the derivation is not bad for uh, this, I mean, they are careful, uh, it's not a naive uh, derivation, they take into account nonlinear effects, okay, which are there. Now, if you want to go beyond the quadrupole uh, emission, what you have to think, what means uh, multipolar expansion? So I want to explain this quickly for the young member of the audience. <laughs> of what means multipolar expansion. Of a field. If, uh, let's, let's start to remind ourselves, if I have the uh, Poisson equation with a source rho of x, in space, static, simple thing. I can solve this by the Poisson integral and then outside the source, if I have the source which is here, then I'm interested in expanding the field outside the source in multiple expansion. Now there are two ways of doing this, uh, either phi external. The traditional way you find in textbooks, you know, would be, there is a four pi, they would be the sum over YLMs, over spherical harmonics, okay? So they would say, ah, you need to expand, and therefore you have a coefficient with the normalization YLM of theta phi. So you would expand the scalar field in spherical harmonic function of the angles, and then, uh, and then there is a power of R, which is 1 over R L plus 1, which is the decaying solution of the Laplace equation. And then this thing, the, uh, the multiple moments for LM would be given by an integral over space of the conjugate spherical harmonics time RL, which is, the, by the way, the, the conjugate uh, solution of the, of the radial equation times the source. Okay? This is good. Now, uh, this is for a scalar and uh, non-relativistic and stationary thing. How do you do for tensors and relativistic things? If you open uh, textbooks, they start telling you, ah, you have to use uh, tensor, tensor spherical harmonics and things like that. And then you realize that the things is not so transparent and actually is less good than doing something else. 
which is to go back to the meaning of, of this, which is what means a multipole. It means that you decompose the field, let's say taken at a certain re in the outside region, in, uh, in, in bits, which are each one of which contains an irreducible representation of the rotation group. So what it means is that this thing, uh, this field, uh, if I rotate the source, if I apply a certain uh, SO3 rotation to the source, that will change the solution, okay? And I want to uh, decompose the solution in a sum of terms, each one of which would be an irreducible representation of SO3. And from this point of view, YLM are confusing things a little bit because they are an irreducible representation, but it is in the special basis. And then it confuses the idea that you have a basis and you have a representation. Why? You can do things by saying differently uh, that you can look for the solution in the following form, sum over L, not M, because M is a basis dependent thing, of just some numerical factor which is fixed for convenience, factor over LN, of an object with L indices times a particular solution of the Laplace equation. The, the fundamental solution of the Laplace equation is 1 over R. If I apply several differentiation uh, with respect to the space index of 1 over R, it's still a solution of Laplace equals 0. So this is a solution of the Laplace equation. And if this object is a symmetric trace-free tensor, which means it is symmetric in all its indices, and if I take a trace, I get zero. This is an irreducible representation of the rotation group. And, uh, and this is a useful thing to do in GR also, which is that to represent the general solution in GR by using as building blocks not YLMs, uh, things like that, but tensors which are symmetric trace-free. This was in particular advertised uh, by Kipthorne, and uh, we built uh, a formalism with uh, Blanchet uh, and higher, we built a formalism which has been uh, used to compute many of the results that I will show. And, uh, and surprisingly, for instance, if now you ask uh, what is the formula uh, which gives these irreducible uh, stress, I mean STF tensors, the multiple moments, uh, in the case where I have a relativistic equation, that is to say, if the equation I solve is not Laplace of phi equals zero, but uh, d'Alembert of phi equals minus four pi rho, or the linearized Einstein equation, you know, uh, uh, h nu nu bar plus the other terms equal uh, 16 minus 16 pi g t mu nu, as I shown before, the Einstein equations look like that. Actually, the formulas did not exist in the literature, okay? And uh, they were derived by uh, Ayer and myself in 1991. And they are very simple formula. I will just write uh, one of them, like for instance, uh, H, the solution of Einstein equation in, t in linearized gravity uh, can be multiple decomposed. And then the solution, for instance, H bar 0, 0, and all the solution can be written in terms of two sets of uh, multiple moments of this type, symmetric trace-free tensor. Let me write just one formula, 4 over C squared, sum over L minus L over factorial L of DL ML T minus R over C over R. And let me explain the notation, okay? Uh, it's a notation we introduced to, to be fast in this thing. Capital L is just a notation for a multi-index I1, I2, IL, okay? When you have L indices, Instead of writing, you just say capital L. It's very fast. Uh, DL means repeated derivative DI1, DIL. So this thing means uh, <coughs> DI1, IL of M with L indices. But here, what is inside? This is a function of T minus R divided by R. But that's a solution of d'Alembert equals zero. That's a retarded wave. If I do special derivative acting on it, it's still a solution of the d'Alembert equation. So here, I have... Uh, uh, a solution of Einstein equation which is based on symmetric trace-free tensor. So it is an irreducible block. You find that the general solution <coughs> of Einstein, Einstein equations can be written in terms of two sets of multiple moments. These mass multiple moments and spin, spin multiple moments with L indices and the spin nature, why this is a mass nature. And then we derive explicit formulas uh, for these multiple moments as a function of the source. Let me write quickly for instance, this thing, 
this multiple moment. Because, by the way, what existed in the literature, for instance, in, in quantum mechanics, there is a huge literature on multiple expansion. If you open Jackson, you have a full chapter on that. But then you realize everything is done for periodic sources, exponential minus i omega t. And then all the multiple moments, they contain Bessel function, j, l, omega, i, and things. These are not in the time domain. What we needed was to have something integrated over the source in the space-time domain. Okay. Uh, and it was faster instead of uh, starting from this redoing. By the way, there were mistakes in the literature also. We redivide from scratch and we got uh, nice results, which have the following structure. So let me write it here. The multiple moment with L indices of the source at retarded time u uh, contains a factor g because I did not put it in front, or I can put it in front here. Integral over space, that's what you expect. And then you expect an integral over the source density. But this is where the things get a little bit more subtle. You have an integral over an auxiliary parameter z, which goes between minus 1 <coughs> and, and plus 1, of a function delta L of z that I will define. There is a function delta L of z, which is a certain coefficient Cl times 1 minus z squared to the power L where the coefficient Cl is chosen so that the integral between minus 1 and plus 1 over z is equal to 1. So this area equal to 1, that uh, fixes the numerical value of Cl that I don't give. Uh, so it's a kind of average over the, the z. Uh, and here you have the x hat L, which means x product with L indices and symmetry trace-free projected. And here you have sigma of u plus r over c z, so this is the uh, time delay within the source, plus two other terms that I do not write explicitly, just the structure. I don't write the coefficient, sigma dot a plus x hat a b l indices, sigma dot dot a b, where, and this was a nice surprise, I mean not surprise because we knew they were good objects, the sigma is exactly the same that I had introduced before in my one post-Newtonian thing. It is the sum of T0,0 plus the trace of the space part. Sigma A is again the same, it's T0A, and sigma AB is TAB, simply, without factors of, of C. So you see, if I neglect the, the 1 over C here, and because the integral of delta is 1, this term is just the usual integral of the source rho times x1 xl. So yeah, I did not write maybe the formula that uh, q i1 i l is the integral of rho times x i1 x i l. The usual multiple moment is you multiply the source by x x i x j x k, you take symmetric trace free. Okay. This contains this structure, but there are relativistic corrections, but not so complicated. And now the, the, the point is that this is for linearized gravity. But in fact, we found, and this was noticed in particular by uh, Luc Blanchet, that you can do full nonlinear gravity simply by using this formula, but replacing t mu nu by the effective t mu nu which, has peer, which uh, uh, appears in Einstein equation if you write them by putting on the right hand side all the nonlinearities and keeping on the left hand side d'Alembert of h mu nu Gothic, h mu nu. So the Landau Lifshitz, essentially the Landau Lifshitz. Uh, stress energy tensor on the right hand side. So this, this term means in the previous uh, diagram which has disappeared when I said I have, because all these diagrams means what? They mean that between the two bodies I have gravitational field energy. And this thing means that it is not only the, the mass of the moving objects but also this gravitational field energy which is emitted gravitational waves. And this is what you do here. So you don't use diagrams to compute that. You, you use these formulas and you, you, you plug in it uh, non-linearly uh, to 3pn approximation. Okay, so this was done. And uh, now, so this I have said, good. And now, uh, at the end of the day, uh, which means at the end of a few years, <laughs> because <laughs> days have passed, uh, you, you get uh, equations of motion and in particular for the conservative dynamics, you get an Hamiltonian for the motion of two black holes, which is of the type I have shown before, uh, except that I have shown the Lagrangian and not the Hamiltonian. And uh, you, you get an Hamiltonian 
which is Newton's Hamiltonian plus correction terms. Okay? And now we have the question of Slava, which is when you have uh, an Hamiltonian, let us say, which let's go immediately to the center of mass. Okay? In the center of mass, for the relative motion, this is p squared over 2 mu minus uh, g m mu over r. So m is the sum of the two masses. Mu is the product divided by the sum, the effective mass. This is the Newtonian Hamiltonian. Now you get corrections like, you know, p4 over c square. I mean, things, uh, uh, gm, uh, uh, okay, I should factorize a, a few powers, but gm over rc square to the first power, and then to the second power, and then to the third power. And, okay, these are successive corrections. First, the thing gets very voluminous, okay? You have many terms. Uh, uh, at the highest level, you have hundreds of terms, nearly. And then, all those terms, they have uh, the same order of magnitude, and you want to compute the motion up to the end nearly, but then all those terms become of order unity at the end, and therefore the thing becomes totally useless, okay? And therefore, and as I said, this is the, the most interesting radiation is emitted in the last orbit. So you want a different formalism which allows to tame all these uh, bad uh, perturbative expansion and get a uh, 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 resummed. So you want a resummation method where you can go to uh, because if you use post-Newtonian method, you have to stop when the two bodies are separated, let's say, by 10 gm over c square. But merger is at 3 gm or 2 gm. So for these last orbits, you need something else, okay? And this something is, by the way, something I, I first presented publicly at KITP, called AITP in front of David uh, in 1999 uh, or 2000, I forget. This is what we introduced with Alessandra Bonanno. Uh, called the effective one-body method, okay? The effective one-body method is a, a, a way, uh, it has two, uh, two effects. Uh, first, it is uh, an analytic method, which by itself contains new information, but it has also the property of being able to use information from all the existing analytic methods. Post-Newtonian theory gives a result, we can immediately transcribe it in EOB, GSF theory gets a result, we can transcribe it. Numerical relativity gets non perpetive information, we can use it. And therefore, we have a formalism which can combine information from various things. And our claim is that this formalism allows to compute the motion and radiation of binary black holes up to merger, and including merger, after merger, with an accuracy comparable to the best numerical data. And we are using, and I will describe, we are uh, using for the last orbit, but in a crucial way, numerical data. And the difference at the end is to make one numerical relativity computation. It takes more than a month. And we need 10,000 templates of gravitational waves, while here it takes less than a second to numerically compute our equations of motion. So from the practical point of view, it is useful, although I think Kip will never mention this, but uh, let's say between us because they invested a lot of energy and money in having uh, big computers to do that, so they tend to claim that analytical so method. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I am not afraid. <laughs> Thank you. <Paul. laughs> Basic idea. Yes, David? When do you, I mean, without the numerical data, when does it stop? 10 GM? No, no. Without numerical data, it goes to merger. That's what I'm going to show in the pictures. The EOB makes predictions that agree without any tuning, because there are two levels of EOB. If we want to the best possible thing, we use all NR information, okay? If we don't use at all NR information, just what is known analytically and what was predicted in 2000, we get an exquisite agreement for some quantities up to merger, okay? And I will show this in a few. Yes? Which is, the, I mean, your, the astrophysicists, they want to have th thousands, hundreds of templates. I don't know thousands, yes, of templates. In the analytic approach, there are only a finite number of parameters you need. Exactly. To what happens. Yes. So why do you need a thousand? Ah, because you need to cover densely. You see, you... you if you have an analytic expression, you can just... No, uh, 
but finally, we don't have an analytic expression. We, we will get analytic equations of motion, okay, which need to be solved numerically. So there is there will be a further uh, okay. Now let me give the essential idea of EOB method, okay. Uh, any perturbative method will give that I have some way of representing the Hamiltonian. I'm talking about the Hamiltonian here. So I have the interaction Hamiltonian of two bodies this way. And the idea is, that's why it is called effective one body. We want to say that there is a correspondence between this system of two bodies of mass M1 and M2 to a different problem, which is one body of mass mu. And when you do it, you really find quickly that mu has to be this, okay? In moving in some, ah, in some external g mu nu, some effective metric, okay? You know some, uh, something that you don't know a priori, okay? Such that the geodesic motion of mu in this effective metric is equivalent to the full two-body thing, to all orders, okay? Exactly. And now, what does mean equivalent? And this is where uh, it was useful to remember something that I learned from John Wheeler from the old days where we met in Princeton, maybe 40 years ago now, uh, which is the following. If you think, we are talking about bound states of binary systems, okay? Yeah, the, sorry, the, the, the motto of Wheeler was that quantum mechanics makes clearer classical mechanics. You should not think uh, in reverse that if you want to understand classical mechanics, think quantum mechanically. So let's think quantum mechanically. We have a two-body, bound states of a two-body system, okay? Now, uh, I neglect uh, radiation damping here. If I do the two-body problem, really, I will have some bound states. First, the thing will be bound states below the sum of the masses C squared, and then I will have things that look like that, you know, like perturbed Coulomb levels, which means that I don't have the, the usual Coulomb degeneracy. And I will have two quantum numbers. I will have the angular momentum quantum number, L, which is an integer, and I will have the radial quantum number, L, okay? So this exists mentally somewhere. If I do an external new in some and, and you realize quickly that you need a spherically symmetric G mu nu for the following reason, is that this thing is SO3 invariant. There are no preferred direction when I have two bodies, okay? So the effective metric should also be spherically symmetric, and therefore it should have also, but now starting from mu c square, a set of energy levels, okay? And now what you know is that here also there will be two integers for this thing. And therefore, if you just think quantum mechanically this way, evidently you want to say, you want to have the correspondence that this corresponds to this, this to this, this to this, and therefore each integer should be the same because they parameterize this thing. So it gives you half of the dictionary, which is that I identify these integers. But what are these integers? These are the, um, how is it called? The, uh, the action variables, integral of PDQ, you know, when you have a, uh, when you have a separated system, uh, the adiabatic invariance, inter I, Ia is integral of Pa dQa divided by 2 pi. Uh, in the quantum limit, they become this integer in, in reverse, okay? So this means I should identify the adiabatic invariance in the two problems. But now what I don't know a priori is this is a certain real energy for the binary system, and this is a kind of relativistic energy, but you see, it doesn't, it's not counted in the same way. So actually, I don't know a priori what is the relation between this and this, but you leave it open. You say, let us find a function f such that uh, this effective energy is a function of E. I don't know what is the function. And let us find a spherically symmetric metric, which means a metric of the type ds squared equals minus a function A of R, dr squared plus uh, plus b of r dr square plus, sorry, sorry, dt square. I mean, <coughs> the time component I denote a of r after changing the sign, uh, coefficient of dr b, and then I go to Schwarzschild type coordinates, which means I gauge fixed things. Therefore, a general spherically symmetric metric should be a function of a of r and b of r. What do I know about a of r and b of r? I know that uh, 
I have a parameter which is not a parameter of expansion, but which is a parameter. We are at, okay, and then I, okay, I'm not very far of this. Uh, we have a parameter of deformation, which is that the ratio of mu to m, which means the product of the two masses divided by the square of the of the sum, is a dimensionless parameter, which when one mass is small uh, is the test mass limit. Uh, so when nu is small, so we call this nu. Nu. And when in the equal mass, it becomes one fourth. So the question is, I want to continuously deform what I know for nu tending to zero to nu equal one fourth by using all the information I have around. And for instance, I know that a of r is must be equal to one minus two gm over c square r because when nu equals zero, this is the solution. And therefore, after this, I will have correction of order that will depend on u, gm over c square r square plus gm over c square r cube plus fourth, etc. So finally, I don't know this number. I don't know the number here. Same thing for the b function or the product a, b, which is one for Schwarzschild, and then I have a coefficient d2, d3. So at the end, I'm looking for these numbers, such and this function, that I explain also, such that I have this matching between levels. And it gives a unique solution. And what is remarkable is that the unique solution is drastically simpler than everything before. Like, let me just show the A function. The, the most important potential is what replaces 1 minus 2m over r, because this is the thing. So this thing, using, and this is the quantity which is known to 10 loops uh, in the small, small new limit and four loops in the uh, complete uh, case. This A function, and let me introduce uh, GM, let's, let's introduce a notation for GM over C square R, okay, U. So in the Schwarzschild limit, this is one minus two U, okay. At the one PN approximation, which is remember the lorentz drost function, uh, <coughs> the correction, which could exist is zero. So this means that I don't need any correction. So all the lorentz dross complication away. Schwarzschild is enough. At the 2pn level, which I, I did not show you, but this is a very complicated thing, all the information is contained in the number two, two new u cube. Okay? This gives the 2pn Lagrangian. At the 3pn, where it's, it's drastically complicated, the information is contained in one number, which becomes non-trivial. It's 94 over 3 minus 41 over 32 pi square. So you have pi square u4. Analytically, last year, we succeeded in computing the u5 things exactly. It contains a logarithmic uh, term also. So this one is known. I don't write it. And also, these things are like linear in u, why there are many complicators. So there are many cancellations, and the, the result is much simpler. New is, yeah, let me say again is mu over m is the, is the product of the masses divided by the square of the masses. So it's a dimensionless measure of how far away I am from the test mass limit, but it's not assumed to be small, okay? Uh, we will take nu equal one fourth most of the time. And, and this function you find is very simple because you find that this E effective must be the Mandelstam invariant, which means the square of the energy minus a constant, which depends only on masses, okay? So you have very simple formulas, which condense a lot of complicated uh, perturbative information. And uh, let me uh, just draw uh, one curve to answer the question of uh, the remark of, uh, of David. Uh, at uh, at uh, 2 p.n. Uh, level, okay, at 1 p.n., I, I draw the function a as a function of u. Uh, which means gm over c square r. In Schwarzschild, it's 1 minus 2u, a straight line. This term is a correction, but this correction is quite small. It gives a function like that, okay? At 3pn, I have this coefficient, but this coefficient happens to be large numerically. It is 18 point something. And when you compute this function, you find that it looks different from the previous one because it does not cross the axis. The axis here means uh, an horizon. This is r equal to m, okay? Uh, here it was a deformed horizon, okay? So it's like strong field information. So you see the post-Newtonian he here fails to do that. But what we had predicted in 2000 was to say, let's replace 
This by a Padé approximate, like all over physics, when a Taylor expansion is not good, you replace it by a rational fraction, okay? And when you do it, you find a function, you find a certain prediction, okay? Which is like that. And now, what do we do to exploit numerical information? We take the known analytical function up to this level, although it is known beyond. We add a next coefficient, E6, U6, as a function of nu. And we, we fit this parameter. We take the Padé approximant to get a function like that. And then we say, let us find, from numerical data, a good value of A6 that reproduces the, the phasing of gravitational waves, OK? This is where we use, crucially, to improve things, uh, numerical data. And let me just show to end. Can we, um, can we get the screen down? Yes. Could you start from the very beginning and these results fix all the coefficients numerically? Maybe the question can be postponed until I've finished because I need to concentrate on where is the thing and mise à jour disponible. Demandez plus tard, yes. I have to find a good thing first. Uh, yes, let me take this one because now. Uh, Full screen is control L. Yeah. Ah, it rotated in the wrong way. Uh, let me take it differently. <laughs> Where are these things? No, not this thing. Um, yes. Let me show. Try to show this one. So how do you do? Just control L. Yes. So it should work. Yes. This is uh, okay. I, I wanted to show something else, which was a long. So this is part of a long waveform. Okay, uh, there is a long waveform, and on this plot is shown two curves: the uh, the numerical relativity gravitational waves. And so you see what is the gravitational wave emitted when two black holes coalesce. Okay, and the numerical the and the effective one-body gravitational waves computed in the following way: we. Uh, here, we, we tune only one parameter, which is this A6 thing, OK? Uh, and, but, but the rest of the approximation would look very, very coarse. Because what we do is we say, during the in spiral, up to the moment where they, that we define in the OB formalism, where, which is like 3M, OK, the light ring, we say we consider the two black holes as two point masses described by the effective one body, OK? And at this moment, we replace these two black holes by a merged black hole with ringing modes. Because we say suddenly, it, the two black holes become one ball, you know, and this ball uh, vibrates. And we say, what is the gravitational waves? It is equal to a sum of ringing modes of a black hole with the condition that this sum should smoothly agree with the waveform before. So you say that it is CK continuous, that the first K derivative agree at one point. It looks very coarse, you know. But when you do that, on this curve, there are two, there are two things plotted, you see? There is the black and the, and the red. And the only difference, the, the black, I think, is numerical relativity. The red is E or B. And the only difference you can see is here, you see? Here, there is a slight not so good just after merger. But, and this continues for thousands of cycles, there is an agreement to like 1% of a radian between what E or B can do and numerical relativity. Uh, and okay, this is first statement. Second statement, I just I finish with those pictures, so I have to find the other pictures now. Ah yes, to answer now the other thing, this one. This is for what uh, angle? Now? Sorry, these are these were two black holes merging, uh, non-spinning black holes on circular, quasi-circular orbits, uh, going around around faster and faster. This is, in my opinion, uh, an impressive result also, which shows that there is some truth in EOB. Because uh, those binary systems, uh, they are uh, losing energy and angular momentum to infinity. When uh, you have a numerical relativity uh, waveform, and when it is, this is on the web, you said. So uh, we asked some, uh, we could not get, although we asked many times from the Caltech Cornell people to have access to their data, we were never given access to their data. So 
We, uh, except now they have put them on the web for everybody. So in the meantime, we collaborated with European groups that gave us access to extremely accurate numerical data of coalescing black holes. And from this data, we could compute the energy and angular momentum lost at each moment. Okay? And therefore, as you know, at the initial moment, the energy and angular momentum of the system, you know how much it loses. You can compute a gauge invariant curve, which is the energy. Here it's the binding energy, you know, like 8% of the binary system versus the angular momentum, uh, dimensionless angular momentum. Uh, so it's a, it's a gauge invariant function. And you can compare two things, the numerical relativity value and the EOB predicted value. And what happens is the numerical relativity is in black. And uh, this is a close up of what happens at the beginning here. At the beginning, the numerical relativity, and then there is the post-Newtonian expansion, which is straight perturbative theory. At the beginning, it happens numerical relativity is closer to Pn, but quickly uh, it goes to the EOB. EOB is red. And then you see that energy versus angular momentum, the, the Pn gets very bad, okay, uh, near merger, as you expect. You do not expect Pn to be good, okay, so this is normal. But EOB, and this is merger, okay. So there is an agreement to a part in 10 to the 3 between EOB and merger. And the most important thing to answer you is that this EOB is untuned. That is to say, it is the 3 pn Paderi something that we had uh, in 2000. We said we should use this. So here you don't tune any parameter. And still, the relation between energy and angular momentum up to merger is analytically well described up to this point. And I think this is all. Because I had a third picture, I forgot which one it was. What is this? Yes, I don't need this. And I just need maybe a sentence of conclusion. Uh, yeah, the sentence of conclusion is only, let me, can I read the last sentence? Yes, chairman said yes. Let me just read this. By the way, if you want to have, uh, because I did not give any references, okay? All the references concerning experimental tests uh, of GR that I'm, I'm, I'm essentially mentioned, they are contained in the review that I keep for the particle data group uh, on the review of particle properties, okay? And that you get on the web. You go to chapter 21 and you have a summary of all what I said and the references. Let me just read the conclusions. The conclusions is all present experimental tests are compatible with the predictions of the current standard theory of gravitations, Einstein's GR. The universality of the coupling between matter and gravity has been verified around the time minus 13 level. This was my first lecture. Solar system experiments have tested the weak field predictions of Einstein theory at the time minus 4 level and down to the 2 time minus 5 level for the post Einstein parameter gamma bar. The propagation properties of relativistic gravity, as well as several of its strong field aspects, have been verified at the 10 minus 3 level or better, because there was a 5 10 minus 4, uh, in several binary pulsar experiments. And what I did not discuss, recent laboratory experiments have set strong constraints on submillimeter sub modifications of Newtonian gravity. And for SLAVA, quantitative confirmation of general relativity have also been obtained on astrophysical and cosmological scales, assuming dark matter and cosmological constant. Period. Thank you.